Hi, good evening. So we wanted to uh, provide uh, just a summary of our summer programs that happened uh, this summer, many of which uh, just concluded just recently. Uh, so to review all of our summer programs, uh, we're gonna give you uh, some brief explanations about um, the success we saw in extended year learning, uh, Math Academy, um, our uh, ESOL program that we ran, the extended year learning, um, extended school year program, and then our Title I Extended Learning Opportunities Program, which is our STEAM camp. So um, I'm gonna start by by uh, talking about our extended year learning program, uh, both the middle school and the high school program. At the middle school level, uh, 1,638 students performing below grade level in reading and or mathematics participated in 20 days of instruction designed to prepare students to build on their su success this coming fall. A three station um, reading rotation, including a short research project on how computer science is embedded into current careers, direct teacher instruction in effective reading strategies, and then individualized and personalized reading instruction using iReady were part of that program. The mathematics stations included direct teacher instruction in algebra using manipulative, manipulative mu, that's a big word for me, I apologize, <laughs> manipulatives uh, in hands-on equations, individualized and personalized math instruction using Ascend, and then um, a station on programming the um, Azobot robots. Um, and the Azobot programming allowed middle school students to report the results of their career research completed in reading. So we tied it, uh, the Azobots, to the reading program as well. And then also at the middle school level, 47 head and shoulder students began a quest to advance their math skills. Um, and this summer, 30 middle school uh, math students completed Algebra 2, and 17 students completed Geometry in the uh, Extended Year Learning Program. Uh, and that was with a virtual e-learning math teacher. So so those students are now uh, ahead of the game and now will enroll in advanced math courses at the start of the um, 19 school year. Uh, our ESOL office increased communication efforts on multiple fronts to get ESOL students into ESOL centers for our regular high school programs in EYLP. Uh, in just a, a few minutes, we'll talk a little bit more about the expanded program around ESOL as well. These are our students um, who need um, uh, less intense services, but still qualify for ESOL services. And so we serve them through our regular extended year learning programs. And the, the big success that we had this year was providing ESOL teachers in those um, regular high school programs with our um, extended year learning uh, summer program. So there were more ESOL teachers providing services uh, to more ESOL students in the system this summer. Our high school programs, uh, we saw 2,175 high school students uh, participate. Uh, most of those students came either through our SPARK program, our extended day learning program, um, or they began through self-paced blended uh, courses because they were interested in um, advancing credit acceleration or um, they were in need of credit recovery. So students worked independently through first instruction with digital content um, and then the digital course content included uh, study notes, journaling, practices, labs, and projects. Um, in all cases, students were required to demonstrate 80% mastery on assignments. Uh, during uh, the high school program enable, enable for them to move forward at their own pace into the next unit of instruction. Teachers also provided alternative assignments and assessments um, when students were not successful with the digital course content, so there was always teachers available to provide additional support. 571 students earned credit this summer for their high school courses at the end of extended year learning and students who need more time can continue to complete those credits at their local high school through our SPARK program or in the evenings through extended day. And then we have a few things to celebrate. Uh, we served over 3,800 students this summer through our middle school and high school extended year learning programs. Um, it was all about building relationships with students and families and teachers. Um, and it really does help prepare them to move on to this school year in terms of their academic studies. Uh, and in addition, approximately 70 students representing 19 different schools will graduate um, August 18th, this Saturday, uh, during our summer graduation due to credits that they earned this summer specifically. So we're very excited about that. 
Okay, so now we're going to move into Math Academy. So the focus for Math Academy for this summer was um, specifically supporting students who are going to be entering grade 8 or grade 9 and taking Algebra 1. And so the intention around Math Academy was to reinforce um, necessary skills for being successful in Algebra 1. Um, and they also had a three rotation, not unlike the one that um, Mr. Imbriali just described. So the first rotation was that they had these rich tasks that were um, problem-based that students in, encountered to help build upon those pre-algebra skills and prepare them for algebra. Um, they also had an opportunity to participate in personalized instruction um, using the Ascend program on the computer. Um, and then the third rotation was a coding activity that was similar to Ozobots, but a little bit um, different. And so um, the idea was that they were um, focusing on their prior mathematical skills in order to strengthen that pre-algebra content and to help them hopefully be successful in Algebra 1. Um, and so that second component, I mean the third component that I talked about, um, they actually coded using the TI-84 calculators. Um, so they were able to use critical thinking and problem solving to derive the code that would enable them to actually move the rover through mazes. Um, and so they had to work in teams. And so this was also our effort to really de um, continue developing mathematical literacy. Um, we define mathematical literacy using the standards of mathematical practice, which requires students to make sense of problems, persevere in solving them, communicate their thinking, um, critique the reasoning of others. So by having this very engaging problem solving activity, um, while also quite honestly reinforcing calculator skills <laughs> um, and using that opportunity about how to um, derive coding, but also so improve some of those um, thinking skills that we know are so critical for mathematics. Um, the slide before that we kind of went over, I didn't read some of the numbers, but you can see that we did have um, over 500 students enrolled in Math Academy at 30 different sites. And um, what's really important is if you look at that last section, almost every single one of our schools was represented. So we had all of our middle schools had students that um, participated, and then 20 of our high schools. So um, I think that's really important that we're providing that opportunity across the system. And then Mr. Imbriali mentioned too ESOL. So we serve ESOL students in a number of ways um, throughout the year, but also with the summer program. We've been here before at the Curriculum Committee talking about um, different ways that we're striving to support our growing population of English learners. And um, one of the things that's important is that we use a WIDA assessment, which is the assessment that determines English language proficiency. And students are actually described as having a proficiency level on a scale from one through six. And so we differentiated the content for summer programming based on their English language proficiency. So for example, if you are a high school student um, at a proficiency level of one or two, you're at the very beginning of um, acquiring English. And so the type of support that we gave you is what I'm going to describe now. So students that were um, proficiency level one or two, we created a dedicated program, which included part of the day was around English language development, um, so that they were actually continuing to learn English. But another part of the day that was critically important um, was this idea of earning credit. So that is a challenge for some of our English learners, especially those that come to us as newcomers in high school because we're sort of already racing against the clock to be able to help them earn um, credit and graduate in a timely way. So we were able to collaborate between the ESOL office and the Office of Health and PE. All high school students are required to take a half credit health class. And so we were able to provide that opportunity for them to earn that original half credit health in this um, program in a class that was co-taught with health teachers and ESOL teachers. So they had that reinforcement of that um, vocabulary and language support but also that health content. We also were able to, um, and that happened at Parkville High School, which is one of our ESOL centers. At Owings Mills High School, um, the population that we were targeting was slightly different because many of the students that were interested in participating had already earned their health credit. Um, so we were flexible and instead provided support with their completing of their bridge project. So as you know, students who don't meet the requirement for the graduation assessment in English or math have the option of um, meeting that graduation requirement through completing this bridge project, which in English specifically is a very um, lengthy and rigorous task with um, a lot of reading and writing 
learning. And so this provided an opportunity, again, with that co-teaching model of an ESOL teacher and an English teacher supporting students with that development. So in both, pro um, both programs at Owings Mills and Parkville, we had an English language development component. We had an academic component, be it health or bridge support. And then the third component, um, we've also talked in this committee a lot about how our English learners also come to us with a variety of social and emotional needs, as do all of our students. But some of our English learners have unique needs and need that um, social emotional support, which is very um, in line with the rest of our evening when we talk about some of the other supports. Mm -hmm. So to that end, we had two offerings um, the students participated in. One was Soccer Without Borders. Soccer Without Borders is an organization that through playing soccer, um, specifically um, nationally targets refugee populations, but it provides opportunities for students to learn team building and communication while having fun through soccer. Um, we had done it in, with a small group at Owings Mills last summer, and a lot of the kids liked it. But we also heard from some kids who said, I'm not athletic and I don't want to play soccer, so what else do you have? And so this year we added a therapeutic art program. So students who were less inclined to play soccer but still needed that opportunity for that social engagement, communicating through the arts, had an opportunity through art. I will share with you that one student told me, I like to sing. So I think this is going to continue um, to evolve. But the point for, for those components in both sites was to really support that social emotional development and provide that opportunity um, for communication, but also that um, social support for our English learners. Um, and then just thinking, uh, we did work with, um, I want to give a shout out to the Office of Transportation because that um, continues to be a challenge because of the nature of um, our center-based model in high school. So um, getting students there, especially in the summer and with some of the other challenges. And our transportation office really helped us this summer to be able to expand to add Parkville. We did not have a site on the east side before, so that was new for us this summer. Um, 81% of students said they would like to come back, um, which is huge when you talk about supporting them in the summer. Um, and what was interesting to us is 86% of the students said that it was specifically about the extra support they got in learning English. And we know that that's critically important. Um, although they did have a really fun soccer tournament between the two schools <laughs> at the end of the summer. For extended school year this summer, we served 4,092 students. Um, ESY services, extended school year, are provided to children if the IEP team determines on an individual basis that it's necessary to continue to provide a free and appropriate public education for them, or FAPE. Um, there are various factors that the IEP team considers, such as regression, degrees of progress, emerging skills, the nature and severity of a student's disability, and special circumstances in order for them to qualify. Services were provided to our youngest learners through community-based instruction through infants and toddlers. Um, their teachers, as well as related service providers, went into their homes or community settings to serve them. In early childhood, we provided services to three and four-year-old learners in either comprehensive or public separate day schools. Uh, their focus was on skill development to address communication, literacy, physical, um, and functional areas of need. ESY services were also provided to elementary students through individualized or sm small group instructional models. Um, their services had a range of IEP goals and um, objectives that were addressing either reading, writing, mathematics, communication, functional or social emotional needs. These services ranged um, for specialized instruction and they um, had more intense supports for our students that were either in self-contained programs or at our public separate day schools. At the middle school level, a similar um, model was there for students where either there was push-in support for those that participated in the programs that Ryan was describing, or there would be self-contained programs, or again, our public separate day schools. Um, and same with the high school level. So either there was a, a push-in support for the extended year learning program, self-contained programs, or at our public separate day schools. Then we also had, um, finally, our post-secondary functional academic learning support a support programs that had an ESY program at the community college or the university college. There are many aspects um, to ESY. Oh, you can go back one more. Sorry. Many aspects to ESY 
for celebrations, special education teachers, support staff, students and families continue to develop strong relationships while preparing our students to be college, career and community ready. Many of our students with the most complex needs were able to remain in the schools where they attend during the school year with their same student uh, staff members, the teachers and support staff to ensure there's consistency within their program and specialized instruction was provided to narrow the gap. Uh, working towards critical life skills as well as the Orton Gillingham program was provided to students on either an individual or small group basis. Um, ESY services focus on individual academic, social, emotional and or related service IEP goals and objectives determined by the IEP team while continuing to provide students with the opportunities for enrichment in reading, mathematics, writing, um, and that large group of students ranged from, again, birth to 21 years old. For our extended learning opportunities program, we held um, STEAM academic camps. The Office of Title I ELO program was created to provide enrichment opportunities for up to 3,500 students in 56 different Title I elementary schools, which we provided at 27 locations this summer. The program design um, included small group instruction for students entering grades one through five in the areas of reading and math, and then students also selected to participate in two STEAM elective programs, engineering with art, or coding. With these electives, um, they were often cited by students as their personal favorites. The math and reading instruction was unique and engaging as well. Guided reading les lessons using nonfiction text helped students focus on science, history, biographies, and geography while building their reading skills. The math instruction focused on real world problems um, and games to increase numerical free, uh, fluency and algebraic thinking for our middle school students. By including the STEAM electives and opportunities for individual attention, students' confidence was um, built prior to starting the next school year. Students also develop knowledge and skills that are aligned with the career demands of the future. Programming, scientific inquiry, and engineering are all skills that are in demand right now and projected to be significantly needed in the future. So not only were the student and teacher relationships developed and strengthened during this program, but family engagement was also a benefit to the STEAM camp. In addition to the culminating showcases at every program site, parents were consistently supported during the enrollment process by family engagement liaisons and the lead teachers. Calls were made to encourage participation. Daily contact was made throughout the program to ensure regular attendance and families were invited to participate in an open site breakfast and lunch program coordinated by the BCPS Food Service Program. To successfully plan and implement such a large program, the Office of Title I ELO required significant coordination with multiple offices, planning meetings, focus groups, starting in September through um, the rest of the year. Uh, the Office of Title I also has a partnership with research accountability and assessment where they will continue to analyze the ELO program data to determine the effectiveness for student achievement. While the scope of the program seems daunting, the collaboration and intense efforts amongst all the stakeholders really made the experience for students and parents most rewarding and problem free. <laughs> uh, so in summary, I, uh, this slide really doesn't do the thank you justice for all of the various aspects of the school system who are involved in putting on summer programs. Uh, I've been involved in summer programs since I came into uh, uh, curriculum and instruction. And the one thing I will say is um, it is essentially like running an entire new school year mm -hmm. for 20 days during the summer. And it is a massive undertaking. Uh, when you look at the numbers of students that we serve during the summer, our summer program uh, that we run uh, across the system is larger than half of the school districts in the state of Maryland during the school year. Uh, and so I think when you put that into perspective, um, it's a very impressive undertaking and it takes a lot of hands to do the project. And that's everything from transportation to food services. We provide lunch to all of our students who are in our programs um, and that, that aspect uh, really makes a difference for students. 
few other things, um, 28 of our school libraries opened for students and families this summer. Um, students and families engaged in maker learning and literacy activities during the summer library programming. Um, and also our summer sites served as locations for the Baltimore County Public Library uh, reading programs. Um, and also our students used summer checkouts and they were able to borrow materials from our school system libraries during the summer. Uh, we had a mobile program that was run at Seneca Elementary School and uh, Battle Grove Elementary School started a Books on Bikes program. So um, we had a lot of things happening. Also, our Baltimore County Public Library branches also served summer meals and snacks to students as well. So lots of collaboration, not only in the school system, but with our uh, county government offices as well, like uh, the public library. Um, so that's the summer programs um, in a nutshell, and that um, we, there are, there is a whole suite of summer programs that deal with adults mm -hmm. <laughs> that we do all summer long, everything from curriculum writing, which I know Megan is uh, gonna talk about in a few minutes. Uh, this is really a snapshot of what we do with students. So uh, thank you very much. If you have right any here. questions. Yeah, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, we had a lot going on. So, um, across all of the programs, whether it was the extended year learning or the uh, ESO or the uh, extended school year, the one thing I kept hearing was uh, reference to programming or engineering or coding. So, mm -hmm. I guess. Ms. Shea can talk a little bit more about that, but what I would say about that is it's about not just science, but it's also about manipulatives, having them do something with their hands. So a lot of the activities involve the mathematics skills, but applying it to some of the other rotations that they're in and making sure that they are moving things around and asking, uh, for example, the Ozobots to move and do things that they're programming them to do. I, I would echo that. I would also say, so certainly there's an emphasis on integration. So how does coding connect to mathematical skills? That helps us answer the age-old question. Kids are always asking, why do I have to learn this, right? And um, the other piece that goes across that is around engagement. It is the summer. And mm -hmm. so having students come and be in um, academic type things, while we all think that's a great way to spend our summer, <laughs> some of our students might need a little more um, you know, uh, external motivation. And so we do think about that, but also in terms of giving them real world application. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about middle school students and high school students being able to see where this type of learning can take them. Um, so all of that to go back to your question, there was a lot of effort put into while we, while we may not have a separate science program or tech program, we are looking for how can we integrate that skill set so that our students see those opportunities um, for developing that skill set, but then also addressing that engagement piece, which is so critical all year long, but probably even more so in the summer. And then the only um, programs that didn't have the specific STEAM type program would be any of our self-contained programs or our public separate day schools that their uh, programs are specific to what's on the student's IEP. But for our students that were included in the mm -hmm. EYLP, they receive that same course. So we talk a lot about how do we evaluate the English language portion of the program, and we work in partnership with DREA. Quite honestly, it's not enough time for us to expect to see a change in the proficiency level because that's a measure that's given annually. What we do look at are some of the um, underlying skills and indicators that are measured on that assessment to see if we see growth on that. So we don't reassess them. The WIDA assessment is given once a year around February, March. We're hoping that that's going to help with that. What we're really hoping is that it's going to prevent Aggression. So we're really looking for it to, at, at best, maintain where they were so that they have that leg up coming back to school. But we don't um, reassess. It's statistically too short a period of time for us to expect there to be a difference. 
but we continue to talk about how do we measure success with our ESOL um, summer programming. And one of the other pieces we talked about was looking at things like attendance, because um, having students engaged in those activities is building their language um, skills. So, um, but we are working um, in collaboration with DRA about how do we measure, because we also have ESOL supports built into some of the other mm -hmm. programs that you heard. Um, in making determination about how does that support their success um, then in the upcoming academic year. So um, we actually are meeting with the principals of Owings Mills and Parkville High School um, in a few weeks to talk about sort of what were the successes. We did have an opportunity to meet with the lead teacher at one of the sites um, to talk about how he's planning on using the information he gained from the students um, to support them then in their fall schedule classes. So how can he build upon some of the um, resources? We were all able to actually visit a health class that was being co-taught and then to look at some of the language supports that were built in the summer opportunity how do we then transfer that for the fall content classes to support those students Absolutely. And so we um, also look at it as an opportunity, anytime you can work with students in a smaller group setting. So we're adding um, that co-teaching model, you're taking that teacher-student ratio down to much smaller than it might be in a traditional high school class. So um, that's what the department chair that was working in Parkville really spoke specifically about. How can I then use this to describe Ryan more individually as a student in terms of his strengths and needs? Um, because sometimes when, you know, the English language proficiency is just one piece of the puzzle when you're talking about supporting the needs. So um, to the way you put it is exactly how we like to think about it. What are this student's strengths? Um, and sometimes we have students that speak 83 languages. So we don't have the capacity to necessarily assess their abilities in their native or what we call their L1, but we can learn a lot about how they learn in those type of environments. So what are some of the structures that support their thinking or what are some of their interests that then we can use to better teach them in the fall would be our hope. The, the other thing I'll, I'll add to that is when we redesigned our extended year learning programs uh, a number of years back and um, ensured that we were providing as much service as possible to, uh, to a student at their home school, what you get from that summer experience then in as many cases as we can as possible is they're the teachers who are going to see those students again during the school year. So it continues to build relationships. There may have been extended relationships that happened from the prior year, and then they're seeing them over the summer. They're continuing to build those relationships and carry them on. Thank you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, like programs with this theme, such as this theme, were there programs that cater to students who were interested in art or other various talents that did not involve STEM? <laughs> So we did have, as I mentioned in ESOL, there was an art choice if they did not want to play soccer. Um, the <laughs> health and the um, bridge projects were really just aligned to helping them earn credit. They weren't necessarily thematic based. Um, the math academy was purely math. <laughs> um, I can ask you to talk about some of that, yeah. Yeah, in, in the Title I programs, it was reading and math based with the STEAM elective um, and the coding as the option. And with the ESY programs, the same. It was specific skills that were on the student's IEP, so not the art option. Now, I will say, um, as Mr. Embriali mentioned before, we do have, there's a visual arts camp, mm -hmm. there's music camp, there's band camp. So there are a lot of other summer offerings that do address that opportunity for students who have a passion in that area to have opportunities. So there are lots of things that go on throughout the summer that we did not include. This presentation would have been a lot longer. Um, <laughs> this was specifically talking about addressing the academic supports. So so that really is the avenue that we have for students who have um, those passions as well. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for your presentation on the summer programs. If we could just move right along into our next uh, item of new business. Ms. Shea, if you'll share with us a summary of our summer curriculum workshops. So I feel as if I'm preaching to the choir because both of you, I want to start by thanking you both for coming. You saw it firsthand, um, the summer curriculum workshops, and I do really thank you for coming. It means so much to the writers to have, I'm sure many of you were swarmed when you came into rooms. They absolutely love when people come and see the work that we're doing. Um, 
I just wanted to share, we did have um, 78 different workshops running. Alima, I think you checked up every single one when you were there with your map. Um, so you probably have that number down. Um, but it was a wonderful opportunity for a lot of um, cross-content collaboration. Um, we had an opportunity for teachers to really um, dig into feedback we've gotten from teachers throughout the year, um, the needs of our students, um, and then really thinking about what are we doing long term Term. We were able to do, um, the majority of the workshops are from academics, but we were able to include college and career readiness, um, special education um, workshops, school counselors had workshops, so we do um, work to support that development across the system. Um, Newtown High School was um, wonderful, and we um, that's another thing, it's hard for a school to let us in in the summer because the building service workers have their own long list of things they're doing to get ready for kids, um, so that I want to publicly thank them, but um, that was also so a wonderful opportunity, um, and and really you saw firsthand the um, couple changes we did add this year. Um, one is that we specifically invited administrators, um, writers. We've always done an open invitation to all of our stakeholders, um, but this year we did have some writers specifically email their building principals and assistant principals and invited them to come participate in um, what we called some fishbowl activities where they got to listen in. There's a lot of really deep thinking, and I know Mr. Young, you and I talked about that. When you sit in that room, the level of um, thought that's really going into unpacking those opportunities for students and um, having the administrator voice in those conversations is really powerful. And we did have a number of assistant principals and principals that joined us. Um, and then the other thing I just wanna um, celebrate is we have been as part of our ongoing um, work as a system around equity, um, we have been working to try to um, increase the number of teachers of color that participate in curriculum writing. Um, that uh, we have a lot of, as you heard, a lot of different summer offerings. And so um, teachers are often working, teaching any of the things you just heard us describe. Um, but we know that it's really important that we have multiple perspectives and that we reflect the population of the students that we serve. So this year, um, Douglas Handy, our director of CTE, led an affinity group working with um, teachers to help us identify um, with our writers what made you want to write curriculum and how can we um, capitalize on those experiences in a positive way to try to recruit um, more and um, a more diverse population of writers. So we're really excited about that work because we think that will only strengthen the curriculum that we develop. Um, we did have a lot of student participation this year, so Halim, I know you were there, Ruben Amaya was there, and he actually came twice um, and brought a friend with him the second time because he had another um, student from the BCSC that um, works to really help communicate that relationship, and so um, that was also very powerful for us to have student voices, so um, we really appreciate that as well. Okay, any questions that you have regarding the summer uh, workshops? I, again, I know you, you visited, <laughs> so you have firsthand experiences to speak from. What is the, what the time frame that it usually runs from? Yeah, so um, we usually start, it's usually uh, the workshop entirety is around four weeks. So um, we typically start the same day that summer school starts and then we end, um, this year we ended August 3rd, but different workshops run for different lengths of time. So some workshops are one week, two weeks, um, sometimes they run the three or four weeks, but the entirety of it is a four week period in the summer. And that, with it ending, as you said, August 3rd, kind of mm -hmm. gives it time to make sure all of the um, information is loaded and ready to go. Yep, so um, there's two things at play. Um, because of our work supporting teachers, most of what we wrote this summer will not be live for use for the first day of school because we want to have an opportunity to field test some of it, work with teachers, make sure that it is ready for prime time. So some of the central office folks now go in afterwards um, where we do some of that revision and continue working with teachers. So we usually have almost a two year cycle in terms of thinking Things that were written this year. Occasionally they will be implemented if they're for like a, the second semester, so that still gives us time. Um, but that's really in partnership with our teachers. We want to make sure they have ample time to um, see the curriculum and be familiar with it before they're teaching it with um, real live students. Um, but you did describe exactly what's going on now. I mean, this week they're doing PD with new teachers, but um, 
the curriculum offices, once the writers go back and enjoy their summer, then we get to work um, really going back into um, things to make sure that we have some consistency. Um, this year we did also use our new learning management system, Schoology, for the writing, which was a great opportunity for our teachers to ha have hands-on access um, and to use a lot of the features um, around collaboration um, for just that purpose. So. Um, it's in there, and um, we're really excited about what we've developed, but most of it won't be taught by teachers um, in August because that gives us an opportunity to also provide professional learning for teachers about what's been written um, and continue to get feedback. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Halima, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, well, if there's no more questions, then we will keep moving through our agenda. Our next um, item is um, Office of Special Education Staffing Plan. If I could have Dr. Wisted and Ms. Ryder come forward. Thank you. Okay, we passed copies of the staffing plan to the two members that are here. So we're here to talk about the special education staffing plan um, and the components that are in it. Um, our, our purpose for doing that is so that we can gain approval to move forward to present it to the full board uh, as information at the September 11th board meeting. <coughs> So again, thank you very much for this opportunity. We're very excited to be here to share with you the implementation of special education staffing for the 2018-19 school year. On um, Baltimore County Public Schools, uh, the staffing plan is developed consistent with the procedures which are provided by the Maryland State Department of Education for the purpose of ensuring that all students with disabilities receive free appropriate public education, which is otherwise known as FAPE. And we want to ensure that students receive what is called as FAPE in their least restrictive environment, which is as determined by individualized education programs, which is IEP teams. Within each staffing plan that each LEA has, of which is prepared and shared with MSDE, there are elements that we're gonna talk with you about this afternoon. So in accordance with COMAR, we have the following elements which are embedded in our staffing plan. There is a section in regards to assurance, an introduction, the staffing plan review, a section on input, maintenance of effort, staffing patterns, and the number and type of providers. Baltimore County Public Schools, the staffing plan, again, as I shared, is developed consistent with the guideline as set forth by MSDE. And it's basically the positions of which have been allocated for this upcoming school year, and it's how they are going to be utilized within the schools. Again, the purpose is to ensure that we are providing FAPE for all of our students and their LREs determined by IEP teams. In accordance with Blueprint 2.0, um, the Office of Special Education provides vision, leadership, and expertise to schools and offices regarding the implementation of curricular and instructional initiatives that support the achievement and performance outcomes for students with disabilities in compliance with state and federal mandates. It's a commitment of our office to ensure that all of our students have access to a full continuum of services here within Baltimore County Public School System and um, to participate with our non-disabled peers to the maximum extent possible. And BCPS, we provide services to students with disabilities and it's aligned directly to the Blueprint 2.0 and it's utilizing the key goals to ensure that um, we are providing FAPE and to achieve the strategic, strategic initiatives uh, within the Blueprint 2.0. The master plan also further defines how the school system ensures that all of our students will be graduating from high school, making sure that they are college, career, and also community ready, as established by the standards by BCPS and also state proficiency levels. So the staffing plan review. 
In 2015-16, the Office of Special Education um, created a multi-year strategic plan to address identified areas of need. The multi-year strategic plan was reflected in our budget requests each year, and we um, advocated for the following positions, of which I'd like to say thank you to our interim superintendent and also to the board for approving the positions to move forward. We have gained more positions in the past few years than we have previously, so that we are very grateful. We did receive um, additional infants and toddlers, um, infants and toddlers teachers. Um, we received four this past year, and that really helps us to ensure that all our youngest learners from birth up to school age are provided with the appropriate allocation of teachers and resources to address their needs. Um, additionally, we also received additional special education teachers because we want to ensure that we're providing a full continuum of services for students who are included in the general education setting to some of our students who might need um, more of a resource model where they have some services inside the general education setting and some outside in more of a self-contained setting. And then those who might require full self-contained self -contained setting all day in one of our comprehensive schools, even up to the continuum of services in one of our separate public day schools. Um, we also received at one point related service providers um, such as speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, and physical therapists to ensure that we are providing services to all of our students. Um, thank you again for, um, we received transition facilitators last year. We are extremely grateful um, to ensure that we are um, providing appropriate transition activities for our students so that they are graduating college, career, and community ready. And board certified behavior analysts is something that we had included in our multi-year staffing plan. These are experts experts and really helping to design individualized um, comprehensive behavior plans for students with more complex behavioral needs as determined through an IEP team. And we're very excited. We, have, we received three this past year, so we have a total of six. Um, we're very excited to have this level of expertise. We also look very um, carefully, I'll just go back one second, that's okay, um, to analyze the strengths of the staffing plans for each year. So we um, really reflect upon the staffing plan, the implementation of um, the resources, and then we identify what our strengths are. Overall, I'd just like to highlight that we do have improved analysis of staffing through multiple assessment data sources, um, all the way from birth, all the way up to post-secondary at 21 years of age. We've also received um, increased staffing to support the special education growth. We continue to grow at a, at a rapid rate for our, our needs of our special education students, and we've been able to um, have the budget approvals to, to maximize the services to our students. We also have asked to have um, to ensure that we provide a continuum of services so as many of our students as possible can receive their services in their homeschool setting. So we wanted to provide more um, teachers to the elementary level. We've also had more improved uh, programmatic options um, in each of our geographic areas. We've also um, been a little bit more flexible with our central office staff in aligning our resources to the needs of the schools. And in addition to um, improved collaboration and uh, more of an intercollaborative process, with various offices are involved in this, such as the Office of Transportation, who we work very closely with, the Offices of Strategic Planning, Facilities, Law, Budget, Human Resources, and Student Data are all involved within this comprehensive process and making sure we're allocating appropriate staffing to our students. And then really looking at um, an alignment of our staffing plan. Is it aligned to what our strategic initiatives are? And that is around early childhood, literacy, autism, and transition we've identified as areas of need, which is reflected in our staffing plan and with the various budget requests. Areas of need that we continue to still um, address, and you'll see through the budget request this year, is we are updating our multi-year strategic staffing plan to make sure that it reflects current and identified patterns, trends, and needs. We are still want to ensure that all of our elementary schools can provide an outside general education setting for our students. We are also looking to expand some of our existing regional options, um, such as our communication learning support programs. Those are regionalized services that we have for students, and we continue to have uh, more students who require that level of support. So we want to make sure that we have adequate caseloads and class sizes for our students in our self-contained classrooms. Um, we're also looking very carefully at our ratios for our regional programs and our separate public day schools. And we're always um, looking to reduce the caseload management for our transition facilitators to ensure that we have a more manageable caseload for our students at the, at the secondary level. 
So Mr. Ryder is mentioning about how, you know, we've already received the board approval for the positions that you're seeing in this plan now. So, you know, all of the pieces of the staffing plan are put together, then when the board approves the positions, and then we wait for the county to approve the board approved positions, that's why you're seeing it at this point, because we have to wait until that time to put it all in the package. Um, input, we do work with a variety of stakeholders throughout the year to ensure that we are receiving input into our staffing plan. Um, as you're well aware, the Office of Communications provides notifications of all the public hearings, the meetings, and the various workshops throughout the year regarding the development of each year's operating budget. Um, these communications are shared via the BCPS website, through our office website, and we are very proud of the fact that we do have representation of many of our families who have students with disabilities involved. Baltimore County participating in those various um, hearings and public input meetings throughout the school year to at continue to advocate for our students with disabilities. In addition to the public hearings, we work very closely and have a wonderful partnership with the Special Education um, Citizens Advisory Council and the acronym for that is CCAC. And CCAC um, is a group of, of parents and community members who meet on once monthly. The, the meetings are open to public. And during those opportunities, we also talk about the staffing plan and our strengths and areas of need with our CCAC group. I also meet with the executive board of CCAC on a bi-monthly bi basis. And then at each month at those uh, forums, we have topics of interest for the families, which um, have included topics such as literacy, um, school climate was a topic. We've had um, struggling readers and dyslexia. We have we've presented with the Office of English Language Arts. Transition um, has been a topic. So it's topics based upon areas of need um, and based upon feedback that is provided by, by families. And all of that information is also reflected in the staffing plan. This past December, our CCAC group provided recommendations to our intern superintendent, Ms. White, and which also provided to the board, which share their areas of um, where they continue to see um, grow, continue to see need and where they'd like to see improvement is around the area of inclusivity mm -hmm. um, and then also around um, school accountability and then also special education staffing were the three major uh, areas of recommendation by our CCAC group, all of which are reflected in our staffing plan. Maintenance of effort, most of our positions are covered by the operating budget, but we do also have um, access to utilize some grant funds to ensure that we have enough um, related services and teachers to provide for our students as reflected in the staffing plan. For staffing patterns, there's major considerations of which we um, uh, of which we take in, into place in recommending our staffing plan. We look at the intensity of student needs um, is an area of which we review. The number of students, which is based on our, called our October count, our census data, of which we submit to MSDE. We also look at teacher responsibilities, um, time required beyond direct services. And when making recommendations around the staffing and the caseloads, the focus has to remain on the student, the types of services that are needed for each individual student as identified by their um, IEP team to ensure that we're providing free, of public, public, free appropriate public education for all of our students. And those principles have really guided the development of our staffing model, making sure we have appropriate supports and related services in place, uh, making sure that we abide by the federal and the state laws and regulations and mandates. And then also the census data, all of it is around the um, census data and it's based upon ratio, which is reflected in our staffing plan. Um, we also include our professional learning opportunities and how we collaborate with other offices. We are very committed to collaboration with um, all the offices within the um, Division of Curriculum and Instruction to make sure that we are providing a coordinated instructional program for all of our students so that they have access to the general education curriculum and to ensure that we're meeting the diverse learning needs of all of our students. Um, services are provided to support the schools in effective implementation of curriculum. We work very closely as well with the um, Department of Human Resources. Um, the Department of Human Resources has multiple recruitment fairs um, throughout the year to ensure that we have um, all of our teacher spots filled and not um, to make sure that we are addressing any vacant positions that we have because special education is a critical area of need, particularly for special education teachers and um, related service providers such as speech and language pathologists. And we need to ensure that we are providing services to all of our students. So we work very closely with this office. 
there's um, an annual process that, that is a very calculated process that we have in place to really identify the allocation of special education teachers and paraeducators. We work very closely with, again, with the Department of Physical Facilities, strategic planning, and with executive leadership to make sure that we have appropriate supports and services for our students. We also have um, worked very closely with other offices such as English Language Arts Office to coordinate our strategic plans to make sure that we are working collaboratively to address the needs of all of our students. And we've shared multiple times um, in various forms such as CCAC and here through cur Curriculum Review Committee how we do have a braided plan with ELA um, where they are providing the letters training to a lot of our teachers and we're providing the Orton-Gillingham training to teachers as well. We've also brought some contracts that have been approved where we are uh, providing applied behavioral analysis training to our teachers of our students to ensure that they can address the more complex behavioral needs of our students. We also do meet monthly with all of our IEP chairperson trainings with our Office of Law to ensure that our teachers are um, current in the knowledge of all legal mandates to ensure that we are implementing all IEPs with fidelity. And then service providers, there is a section of the staffing plan which does include a description um, of all of the types of programs that we have within Baltimore County and the type of service delivery. Because in Baltimore County, we offer continuum of services ranging from students who might be fully included and might have a, a special education teacher co-teaching. They might have a special education teacher pushing in to provide services in a small group. Um, and then also they might be what we call pulling a student in outside general education where some of our students might have to receive their services for a variety of reasons outside of the general education setting to, to receive that specialized instruction support. Embedded in the section two, you will also find um, how we, the number that we have for our related service providers. In our staffing plan as well, there are positions of which are not funded by our office, but we also do include in our staffing plan, such as um, school psychologists, counselors, nurses, other providers who would be providing services to our students with disabilities. That's reflected in our staffing plan as well. And it also talks about the role, um, not only the number of staff, but the roles of staff within a, school, within a school setting, such as an administrator, a general education teacher, a paraeducator, or anyone who would be providing supports and services to our students. And finally, um, just as we've done to prepare for this year, we're already into the mode for planning for next year's 2019-20 um, staffing plan. It is a, a tedious process, and it's something that we just don't um, complete and put away. It's something that, of which we are addressing and monitoring very closely within our office and in tandem with other offices. We will monitor the effectiveness of this plan throughout the entire year with our leadership team and with other offices in BCPS. Our goal is to ensure that we are providing services to all of our students um, to the maximum, and ext maximum extent possible in their least restrictive environment and as much as possible within their home school. Um, our goal was written with providing this level of service to all of our students. Um, for many of them, it means, again, receiving their services in their home school, and for some of them, they might have to receive that in a different school setting and more of a regionalized model. We will be reviewing this throughout this year, and then we also will be making um, adjustments accordingly um, from the analysis of this year's plan, in addition to having feedback from the multiple stakeholders throughout this year as we plan for next year's staffing plan, and then will also be reflected with the budget request that moving forward for this year. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> it is an involved um, process, so any questions that you may have? Alongside making sure that the students receive specialized help, are they also encouraged to be in a setting such as we are and given the support of how to function and how to be among without feeling out of place? Absolutely, and that's a great question. And. How the services um, are determined for a student is through the individualized education program team process. So the IEP team, which is inclusive of the parent, a special education teacher, general education teacher, would talk about the strengths and the needs of the student and how to best um, how to best meet the needs of the student. It is our goal to ensure that they have those inclusive opportunities as much as possible. We would ensure that they are able to um, graduate from here at College Career and also community ready. So IEP teams are definitely encouraged to look as for many inclusive opportunities as possible for the students. Thank you. 
Oh, no. <laughs> In one of the slides, you mentioned um, grant funds mm -hmm. as, um, as a way of providing services. Mm -hmm. Is there usually a case that, okay, the grant fund run out or it runs its time frame, but yet the services are um, extremely beneficial to our students and we bring that in-house? or do we search for similar grants to help fund those services, or a combination of both? With a little bit of both. So um, we do have, um, all of our positions are allocated to ensure, first and foremost, that we are allocating the appropriate number to, to schools, um, from teachers to paraeducators to um, behavior interventionists to, um, to other, uh, to different support staff. Um, the grant funds are also used as an additional source to ensure that we're providing faith to our students. Um, for our related services, we have also used um, contractual providers as well to make sure that services aren't missed for our students. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And you want to bring this before the board, uh, you said September 11th? Yes, to go as information only. And every staffing plan is posted publicly. It's on the Office of Special Ed's website, so yearly, it's. It's a public document, um, and so we're here today to just put it through for information only to the board, so then, then we could post it again publicly and, and refresh the one from last year with this one. <laughs> okay, so you need our approval right now to send it forward to the board. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> well, I haven't given us the motion yet, but it's since it's you and I, that they need a motion from us to send this forward to the board. Uh, do you agree with sending it forward to them? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it sent forward to the board. Great. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you both. Okay, moving on to the next segment of our agenda, we'll be sharing um, curriculum or instructional materials that we'll be uh, bringing forward um, to contracts committee, uh, but again, our purpose here in curriculum committee is to share what the materials are, the purpose that they serve instructionally, um, and the contracts handles contracts aspect of it. So if I could have um, Mr. Borelli and Mr. Corns come forward, we're gonna share our augmentative and alternative communication devices, uh, instructional materials that we'd like to bring forward. Hello again. No, oh, why, not yes, not yet. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Corns and I are not here alone. So we do have um, Kama. Kama, Kama Dwyer. Kama, will you raise your hand and say hello? Kama's going to come up in a minute. Kama is actually the team leader for our assistive technology team. Uh, what uh, many people don't realize, but in the system, we've actually had an assistive technology team for a number of years. So the assistive technology team um, works in my department, and they work directly in concert with the Office of Special Education. And so um, they are constantly providing support to uh, schools around the county uh, where students are using um, technology tools to meet their specific needs that are addressed that are addressed in their um, IEPs. So uh, this uh, was an was actually an RFP um, that went forward around augmentative and alternative communication devices. So we've been providing communication devices in some form to students for well over 20 years. Um, and we went out uh, to RFP in order to replace an expiring contract. These devices are specifically designed to be used with students who need accommodations in communicating with others. So they truly are communication devices. Um, and then um, Mr. Corns will talk a little bit about uh, how this process works with these. So these communication devices are deployed uh, to the students through the IEP process, and once a student's been identified as needing an augmentative or an assistive uh, communication device, our assistive technology group uh, will go out and evaluate the student and assign an appropriate unit for the student's needs. This device is part of the student's IEP, allows them to receive uh, free appropriate public education, or FAPE, as you'd heard earlier, uh, as required by law. Um, our forecasting of need for the number of these devices devices based on previous years, but we understand that additional students uh, uh, can be issued through an IEP process or they may come to Baltimore County uh, with IEPs in place that already require a communication device. So during the RFP, we evaluated the devices for this list of um, 
uh, criterion, and um, the uh, vendor selected uh, their product met all of the needs that we had for them. So um, actually, I'm going to have uh, Kama come up with one of the devices. So you are going to get to see how one of the devices works. Uh, and we really want to show you how they work. Um, there, uh, I think last year we issued, if I'm correctly, about 29 of these devices. Kama, is that the right number? About 29 were purchased. So uh, 29 were purchased last year. There's a, about a total of 118 in the school system right now, but that number is constantly fluctuating based on um, the IEP team process that goes on on a, on a regular basis. So this is an example of one of the devices that we might need to provide for the student. So you can see it comes in like a tablet form, but it's portable for the student to be able to carry with them. Um, it can go between home and school, community. And it comes already programmed with a language system that we work with the teachers and the students to support their use of it. And it um, becomes their voice. So just for example. I. I have trouble doing it sideways. <laughs> need. I need. So it becomes the, the student's voice for the students that aren't able to communicate themselves expressively. I can pass it around if you'd like to see it more closely. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Young, would you like to pass it try it out? <laughs> I, um, while he's looking at that, I think, you know, uh, we're looking at an example for, uh, you know, students, but if you think of uh, perhaps a famous person, Stephen Hawking's mm -hmm. is an example of someone who throughout their entire, you know, you know, they became, you know, well known for their augmentative communication device. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Each, each individual device is, um, is fairly expensive, and so the individual costs of them uh, can add up pretty significantly. So that's why um, when you look at the whole total picture of it, it needs to be a formalized RFP process. Mm -hmm. Is it talking to you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so. Um, a device like this, this um, I had the opportunity to attend Ridge Ruxton's graduation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this would be like an, a, a young man did the pledge. Yes. Um, and right. so he would have had yes. this mm -hmm. very, de okay. That's exactly correct. So, so that's this whole presentation. If you have, uh, we'll take any other questions that you, that you might have around this particular uh, contract. I think you can, you as you uh, were sharing, Mr. Young, uh, you can understand firsthand from watching that student how uh, fundamental this resource is for their their ability to communicate and function as close to uh, able as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, One hundred and eighteen or so in the in the system? That we currently have assigned to students, yes. Okay. Um, Each year we could have additional students come in that have a need. Okay. Uh, I, and it's mainly through, you said, mainly through the IEP process where Correct. So in each IEP review process, there's an area of the IEP during which um, assistive technology needs to be considered for each student. And so if it's appropriate for that student, that would be a place where it would either be documented that they have a need for this, or they may decide that the student has a need for assistive technology, but they need to reach out to us for support to determine what the appropriate support would be. And then we work with the school and the student to determine that and provide. Okay. And that's not the only assistive technology is probably the most common one we use or for communication yes so we have other we have other types of devices that we might use for students depending on their need um, depending on what level of support they need some of the students at Ridge Ruxin might need additional support such as switches because physically they that's how they would access the device um, we have assistive technologies that are computer supports as well that would be just software so there can be a range but this is for communication. This would be fairly typical for what we provide because it can be customized within this for each student. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Halima. I thought you were. No, okay. Um, you said that the numbers of the devices fluctuate. So has there ever been a time when there were more students that needed the device than available? Or is there always enough? 
No, because we pr we purchase them per need for student. That's great. Mm -hmm. Which is the exact reason we want to make sure that we bring this contract forward to the board because we want to make sure we have the right spending authority um, as needs increase, decrease, whatever, however that fluctuates. Okay. What's the, um, I guess, the lifespan of the devices? Uh, they come with a one to two year warranty and then we extend the warranty. Um, we could have one for seven years if it, if it holds up. It might need a repair or a new battery which we're able to do, um, but probably about seven, eight years, maybe longer if we're lucky. <laughs> sure, yes. Are these like the latest updated versions or are they always coming out with helpful and applicable to students? For this company, this is the newest model that they have. So like as we purchase, if, they've provide, if they have come out with a new model, we, buy, we purchase the new model. Well, we can still maintain the older ones, but we would buy the new model. And there's always the opportunity to update the software. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. I think if there's no more questions on augmentative technology, then we will move on to our next uh, item of instructional materials, digital library project and brain pop. Okay, so, uh, Mr. Corns and I are gonna talk about the MDK-12 Digital Library Consortium, which is another contract that'll come before the board on the 11th of September. Uh, the uh, MDK-12 Digital Library Consortium was established in 2003 uh, to provide consortium buying power in the state of Maryland. Uh, through the MDK-12 uh, Consortium, uh, we take advantage of greater pricing volume uh, and the MDK-12 uh, Library Consortium is actually written into Comar, it's state law. So um, it basically says to create physical efficiencies in the purchase of digital content through enhanced cooperation among schools and the department. And when it says the department, they're speaking about the Maryland State Department of Education. Uh, to support effective teaching and learning by connecting digital content with the Maryland content standards, workforce development, and science and technology, engineering, and mathematics initiatives. Um, on the slide, you can see that we reference the section of uh, Comar that it uh, does uh, talk about here. All 24 of the LEAs in the state of Maryland participate and are required to participate through the um, MDK-12 Digital Library Consortium. Uh, and uh, the MDK-12 Digital Library Consortium has an annual process to add additional content to their offerings, um, as well as offerings that might come off of uh, the consortium. And the process um, also evaluates the merit of the content within the specific resource. So um, the slide here gives you an example of how the timeline works. Uh, we're in the phase in August where new content is considered. Again, it's considered by all all 24 LEAs have representative, representatives who sit on the library consortium. And then that, those, uh, that group of individuals reviews new content. There's an evaluation and selection committee that meets. There are vendor demonstrations. It is very similar. It models, uh, in fact, the way we uh, go through our curriculum selection process here in Baltimore County. Um, and the actual procurement office who works with each of these vendors is actually the Montgomery County Public Schools. So there is one procurement office in the state of Maryland who operates the MDK-12 Digital Library Consortium, and in this case, it's uh, Montgomery County. So through MDK-12, uh, we procure resources that include culture grams, the Gale databases, World Book Online, uh, Scholastic uh, Go, the SERS database, and the ProQuest databases. Um, in addition to direct curriculum links, we also have these resources available through BCPS-1, and last year we received over 400,000 clicks uh, on these database um, resources. Okay, are there any questions? And I think Halima, you perhaps have accessed some of these over different years <laughs> with us. So, so, yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, yes, I that's can correct. answer your question. Right. I, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, right. could, I couldn't so hear the question. These yeah, we are, are... Right. These are <laughs> instructional materials that we use, and the part of our presentation here is to explain how, how we use these instructional materials. Why do we need these? What's their, their purpose and their function? Um, so that you as the curriculum committee, because I know this is your first curriculum committee, that you as a curriculum committee understand these materials and what purpose they serve and how they matter for our instructional program. And so here what you see is really our col a, a collection of our digital resources that we, we acquire through the MDK-12, um, what did I... What's it called? Consortium. MDK 12 consortium, Library, library Consortium. consortium. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are resources, digital resources, that every school system in the state of Maryland, every school system needs these types of resources. So they have worked together in this consortium to identify what are those resources that every school system is going to want to have world book uh, for kids. Um, and so that's how we access these. And so as you may be familiar with from accessing different ones, there is an abundance of uh, research information within each of those. I kind of think of it uh, a little bit of, um, I'm a little bit older, and so uh, I remember as a small child, the encyclopedia, my mother had a collection of encyclopedias, and when you went to the library, you had to go into the research section. So, so much of that type of information is accessible through digital content. The, and the consortium was established back in 2003, really because um, there needs to be a base set of resources available to every student in the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so the consortium came together as 24 LEAs and then it became a part of Comar to say, this is the base set of resources that, um, that everyone needs to have access to. And um, it's really through all of our public school libraries that these resources become available. We, um, over the last number of years with BCPS1 and our digital ecosystem have been able to take uh, what used to be these resources that were constrained to electronic resources accessible through a library to now resources that are accessible through a library and that library really can be in your home as well. So that's the added advantage. Mm -hmm. And so we have one more slide here to talk about and this is a shift with one of the products that has been a part of the MDK-12 digital library um, for a number of years, and uh, we've been using this product for years here in Baltimore County. And, um, Jim? Yeah, so as uh, Mr. Rembrandt Elliott said, uh, until 2007 and 18, we were procuring brain pop through the MDK-12 digital offering, but uh, they're no longer participating in that consortium. Uh, so we are currently working to establish a contract with brain pop because it's deeply integrated into our school environment and curriculum. Um, brain pop provides resources uh, that present curricular concepts in easily accessible multimedia assets. Uh, students can either browse BrainPop or their teacher can directly uh, deploy them through our LMS Schoology. Um, from August uh, 2017 to, to June of 2018, BrainPop received roughly a million clicks through BCPS1. Um, and it's a uh, primarily focused on an elementary and middle school level. Mm -hmm. But we, but but I know from my experience with high schools, it's also used at our high school level as well. Uh, there is um, much love for Moby. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know Moby, that is that wonderful uh, character who's on the screen there. Um, uh, it, if if uh, the 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 brain pop resources in Spanish, the SL resources, um, the French resources, the junior resources, the general resources are heavily used and um, heavily embedded um, in our curriculum and have been for quite a number of years. It's a, it's a, it's a well-used resource that we have here in Baltimore County. Mm -hmm. So again, if you have any questions around this resource, we're happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Great. both. Thank you all very much. Okay. Our next um, instructional uh, material that we'll be um, reviewing with you is conscious discipline. And so if I could ask Ms. Shea to come forward. Joining her as well, it looks like is Ms. Ward. Ms. Ward works with our uh, early childhood, pre-K and kindergarten. Hello, back again. 
Um, so um, Ms. Ward is here joining me because she is our supervisor in the Office of Early Childhood. Um, I have been to this group before around conscious discipline. Um, it'll be new for you, Halima, but um, unfortunately Ms. Ward wasn't able to join us last time and this is really her baby. She has done a lot of work with this, so I thought you should hear from the expert. Um, because we have done this before, we're not gonna necessarily go all the way back, but we did wanna kind of give a refresher of what conscious discipline is. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, talk about a contract we will be um, bringing forward um, for modification. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good evening. All right. So conscious discipline is a, um, an approach to teaching students social emotional skills and executive functioning skills. Um, the reason that we originally went looking for uh, an approach that would allow us to address those skills is we were seeing more and more pre-K and kindergarten students arriving in school without readiness to learn. So we really needed to help them understand uh, how to be part of a school setting prior to expecting them to learn academic skills. And some of the things listed um, are what we were experiencing, just impact of chronic environmental stress um, on their brain development, the patterns of difficult behavior that we were seeing across uh, schools in the young classrooms, uh, limited responses to traditional disciplinary or classroom management approaches, and then um, recognizing that, that part of the problem was we may have been using some strategies that weren't necessarily developmentally appropriate. So uh, my staff and I had the good fortune to attend a national conference where each of us independently discovered conscious discipline and came back and put our heads together and felt like this was the way to go. Because it's brain researched, um, it is, uh, it, not just a kind of flash in the pan, do a lesson for 15 minutes and then move on. Mm -hmm. It incorporates and integrates social emotional learning throughout the fabric of the classroom and throughout the school day um, in the moment when students need it. So uh, that was why we originally selected conscious discipline. Mm -hmm. And the, the constructs that conscious discipline promotes are bulleted on the presentation. So um, connections not just between the adult in the room and the students, but connections among the students themselves, teaching students how to get along with each other, even during conflict. Um, there's a, a concept called the school family that goes along with conscious discipline that is very strategic in helping students feel safe and connected at school as they do at home with their family. Um, developing routines and rituals so that uh, we build a sense of safety for students through instituting very consistent routines that are developmentally appropriate and rituals that allow them to connect with each other. Um, we support the social and emotional development by teaching them specific SEL skills such as what to do if someone bumps into you, um, or how to ask for a turn at a center. And then promoting executive function skills, Dr. Bailey, the creator of Conscious Discipline, in the brain research that she bases her work on, um, really latches onto the idea of students' frontal lobes not being fully developed um, until the age of 25, and therefore we need to, um, <clears throat> yeah, so we've, we've started calling our students a quarter tank full, <laughs> um, and recognizing that we need to help them fill their tanks by doing activities that very specifically promote executive function. And as we transition, I just wanna, and I'm sure you were already hearing threads, but this program really is the intersection of our superintendent's focus on both literacy and climate. Because when we talk about conscious discipline, we really are supporting that idea of the whole child and thinking about how can we make that school climate one that's welcoming and supportive um, in a way that's also approaching it from a teaching standpoint and not a, um, punitive way. Um, the other day I was reading an article and it talked about how behavior is an attempt to communicate. So a lot of our young students, not only do they not have the brain development, but they don't yet have the language development. So they may not have the language to express their feelings. And so part of this is about teaching children how to have that emotional self-regulation. So what do I notice I'm feeling right now? And then giving them the tools to begin to have those conversations so that they can participate in a problem-solving exercise. So when we think about 
about that idea of prevention and restoration as part of our climate work, this is about making that very relevant for our youngest children. What does that look like to help our youngest students um, be able to have the language that they need um, and the understanding of how to participate in those types of situations? So given all of that, um, what we saw pretty quickly up on implementation at the pre-K level, which is where this started, was a tremendously positive impact. Um, during the first year of implementation, we wrote a, a unit of study to introduce the concepts and structures to students, but also to teachers, because one big piece of conscious discipline is it teaches adults to also respond differently to conflict, so they're responding to students in a more um, proactive way, recognizing, as Megan said, that all behavior is a form of communication and trying to figure out what missing skills the students have. So we had a lot of success in pre-K, a, de a decrease in behavioral referrals from pre-K classrooms to the Office of Special Ed from um, the year before Conscious Discipline, we had more than 20 referrals during the month of September from pre-K classrooms. During the year in which we rolled out Conscious Discipline, we had two referrals during the whole first quarter. So huge impact. The following year, we were able to show when we rolled it up to kindergarten that um, we're also seeing impact on academic achievement. So last fall, the kindergarten readiness assessment data showed a jump of six percentage points in readiness in language and literacy and 10 percentage points in readiness in math. And the only change we had made in pre-K or the beginning of K was conscious discipline. So we've gotten tremendous positive responses from administrators, from parents, from students, from teachers, um, and consequently, more schools are looking to take uh, the, the approach of conscious discipline school-wide, and um, in working with our office and the Office of School Climate, we are hopeful that we'll be able to also include subsequent grade levels. So this year, the rollout has gone to first grade. Um, there's a unit of study now written for pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade that's uh, taught at the very beginning of the school year, three to four weeks, teaches the routines, it establishes um, roles for all of the adults working with the students, and then it, it, through a literature-based approach, we teach the strategies and rituals. These, this is just a, the schools that off the top of my head I'm aware have chosen to go school-wide and are pursuing additional coaching and um, lesson development. And so part of why we're coming back was not only to update on the success that we've had for a, a program that we've bought before, but um, specifically to modify that contract. Originally when we came, we viewed this as early childhood, and so we had specified those grades, and the response from elementary schools has been overwhelming, that they want to use this for all of their elementary students, um, that they want to provide that professional learning for um, all of their teachers. Um, in particular, this next week, when teachers come back, um, professional study day, we are really excited about a collaborative effort between the Office of Early Childhood and our special area departments um, because our art, music, library, PE, um, they teach our youngest children too. And so we want to expand this offering to be able to include them to help teach those teachers how to support those developmentally appropriate needs and practices. Um, we're also excited that we have in our um, partnership with the Office of School Climate, um, we're able to use grant funding to continue to support this expansion. So we um, will be coming back to the contract committee to modify the contract, um, both to expand to other grade levels, um, because we do have a long range plan to roll that out, um, to support the notion that if a school wanted to do professional development with all their teachers, that the contract would allow for that. Um, and then to increase that spending authority to allow us to use those grant funds um, for this purpose. Um, we also believe that this is, um, as I said before, it is the intersection of that literacy and climate work. We use a lot of literature-based stories um, to help support that climate. Um, but you will also hear um, pretty soon from the team around restorative practices, um, which is also an incredibly powerful tool this is a wonderful way to arm our students with the tools they need to participate um, in that restorative practice that you'll hear more about in a moment. So we believe that they go hand in hand really well. Um, and again, it's always um, so 
rewarding for us when things are organic. When our teachers are coming to us and saying, this has um, changed the way that I approach my back to school. We've had teachers reach out and say, this has been the best start to school that I've had, or I'm so excited to go back to my school and try this. We've had parents um, tweet at us about things that they're doing at home that they've learned through um, this approach. It's always very gratifying, um, but we want to get ahead of ourselves um, in terms of making sure we have the contract support to allow for that growth to continue. Okay, do you have any questions around conscious discipline? So the whole goal is to make sure that it's eventually school-wide at some point in mm -hmm. and with it being school-wide, would it take a lengthy, would it be a lengthy and tedious process? Um, in terms of how we roll it out? Yes. So we'll essentially be rolling it out a grade level at a time for two through five. We may try to uh, maybe do two grade levels at a time, um, but that's essentially our plan. We have like a three to four year plan to do second grade and bring them on board. Um, the teachers are ready. What we would like to do is to start with the PD for teachers school-wide first, but then some of the curriculum support and materials we would do one grade level at a time. Maybe we can get two going, but we also um, don't want to go too fast to overwhelm the teachers. But it's been really critical that we also have curriculum development to go along with that. So we've partnered with um, English Language Arts as well um, so that we um, don't just add one more thing to teachers' plates. Mm -hmm. I know you've heard from even most recently, Abby Beaton, the president of the teachers' union, talked about how powerful this is, but how necessary it is that we provide support for teachers. So we do this well. So we want to go as quick as we can and as slow as we must <laughs> to make sure that we do it well. I heard you mention um, a parent tweeting about using this at home, and that, that I guess, was my um, question of how do we get parent buy-in? How do, you know? Because if your your example was of teaching students when they bump into one another, well, if we're we're teaching them, okay, if you bump, say you're sorry, but if the parent is at home teaching, if somebody pushes you, push back harder you're now going to have a young child that's confused, mm -hmm. getting two different messages. So how do we get parent buy-in? So there's a couple ways. Um, part of it, we have partnered with Parent University um, to talk about opportunities to offer workshops in individual schools. Um, so they've already mm -hmm. been doing workshops with parents. Um, we also have teachers that um, build this in as a part of back to school night um, when they meet with um, parents for pre-K families. Um, when we do gradual entrance in pre-K and kindergarten, it's a part of that collaboration with parents. What we've also found is the greatest success comes when our children are actually going home and sharing with their parents that this um, so we have an ongoing collaboration to try to support parents but then also just keep them in that communication loop of this is how we respond so that they can again to your point have consistent messaging um, so that the student is hearing that message which is another really powerful thing if our students are hearing it from their art teacher and their music teacher and when they get to second grade their teacher is able to understand even as we're rolling it out curriculum wise when the entire school community is supportive of that then children hear that language reinforced um, and continue to provide those opportunities for parents. We're doing some direct work on that this year. Um, my office publishes a monthly newsletter for pre-K and K teachers, and one component of that newsletter is um, connecting with families. There are uh, now resources available on the Conscious Discipline website specifically for parents um, that talk about how to implement the ideas in the bedroom, in the kitchen, in different areas of the home. Brush There's, your teeth. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, like one. morning routines. How do you get that to go smoothly so you're not pulling everyone's hair out before you get out the door? Um, there's also, um, the, the way that we report on student behavior we are changing in early childhood classrooms, so you don't get one of those typical referrals that makes parents see red. Uh, your child came home on red today, or your child hit someone today, fix that. The, the conscious discipline um, message to parents is your child had a conflict today. Here's the way we handled it. Here's the new skill that we taught. Here's how we taught your child to breathe and regain composure. And here's what you can do at home to talk through and encourage that behavior as well. So we're trying to hit that from a variety of, of angles. We recognize and agree um, the more consistency between home and school, the better for the kids. With the newsletter you referenced, um, is that something that gets shared with parents also, or is that information for 
the teachers. It's information for the teachers, but a specific portion of it this year is um, building homeschool connections. So we'll be giving ideas for uh, pre-K teachers, pre-K kindergarten teachers to use when they're working with families. And, and a lot of parent university. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. And a lot of our teachers have a home newsletter. That's mm -hmm. a part of their routine. So several teachers use some of the resources in the letter yeah. and then add that to the parent newsletter Turn that as well. Around for parents. Thank you. That's right. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Okay. We have one last um, instructional item that we'll bring forward um, to share with you, and that is restorative practices. And again, as uh, Ms. Shea was speaking uh, about conscious discipline, what you'll, you'll find, Helima, I'm not sure how familiar you may be or not at this point with restorative practices, but these, uh, both conscious discipline restorative practices are um, incredibly complementary around helping students learn how to um, regulate themselves and engage in um, more productive relationships um, and how to, in this case, really restore when they've had a mistake, when they've had an incident, um, and that there's, a, there's an entire range of resources that help them learn um, community building aspects up front to help prevent conflict, but then as when we as humans do have conflict, um, how do we resolve that in a productive manner uh, for the people involved and for the, the school community or the classroom community. So on that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Wisted and sure. uh, Dr. Brinkley and Ms. Musterford. Dr. Musterford? Ms. Ms. Musterford. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, similar to Ms. Shea, I have been in front of the curriculum committee talking about restorative practices um, before. And uh, we have also done presentations with the CCAC and multiple presentations this year going on tour with the advisory meetings. Um, so a lot of pr people have heard me talk about restorative practices. So I have Dr. Brinkley Parker and Ms. Mustafer with me um, because we also are bringing back a contract at the September 11th board meeting for modification. Um, due to the great interest and success of restorative practices, we have many schools interested um, in participating in more professional learning with it and, and additional coaching. We have a set of schools that we've been using grant funds with, um, and Ms. Mustafa will explain that a little bit more. Um, but that, that's our purpose for being here. So I'm just introducing, reminding people about our BCPS framework for climate where prevention, restoration, and logical consequences is how we have this interplay and restoration being the key of it where restorative practices, um, you know, is the product that we are using with many of our schools. Um, so when you think about the concept of restorative practice and when you look at the framework that we have to guide our office. We have a continuum that is introduced through restorative practice and implementation when we talk about creating environments that are safe and conducive for all learning. And what you'll see is a range of practices from informal to formal structure. Though these are introduced through restorative practices, the concept of them can be utilized throughout any facet um, of the educational program. Additionally, we look at goals when we talk about the implementation of restorative practices because we know that now all students come um, emotionally ready with the knowledge and attitudes in order to build those positive relationships and to maintain their emotions or handle themselves or others with care. And so when we have um, restorative practices, which is an evidence-based practice that is embedded within our school, in a manner that allows for it to be the fabric of the school, we know that we are looking at a process to change the climate of the um, educational environment. Um, restorative practices, uh, one of the areas that we took restorative practices as an outgrowth of was a Maryland AWARE grant. Um, when you see Maryland AWARE, it represents Maryland Advancing Wellness and Resilience in Education. It's a partnership between Baltimore County Public Schools, um, the University of Maryland School Center for School Mental Health, SAMHSA, as well as MSDE. Um, the grant was awarded approximately four years ago, and one of the key initiatives is really ensuring that our staff and our students and our community are educated around wellness, um, as well as being abreast of what's going on with mental health. 
Um, one of the key things that we brought aboard um, to address this was restorative practices. So as you can see, we've been really working to build capacity through professional learning. We've had five sessions of days one and two training. We've had two sessions of advanced conferencing. Um, we have trained 249 staff, and as of today, that has increased to 274 staff. Uh, we had training in the last two days at um, Parkville Middle School. Um, so we definitely wanted to report that we're gradually <laughs> increasing those numbers. We, um, this spring, we partnered with IIRP, which is one of the vendors in the contract. And um, to build capacity within Baltimore County sc Public Schools so that we can continue to train um, and, and not lose any components, we brought on 12, uh, we trained actually 12 individuals to be trainers. And this summer, um, we have initiated the first round of having um, restorative practices taught by trainers that are within our current staffing structure. Um, additional professional learning, we did a two-hour leadership meeting this spring, and that was to bring administrators and their teams together to talk about how to plan in moving restorative practices forward. Uh, we did a two-hour overview with EDLP. Um, there's been training for PPWs, and um, there has been seven restorative practices leadership teams. And in those teams, in that team, what we are doing is we're um, developing a guidance document to support the application and implementation in the learning environment. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. I'm not flipping at the same time. <laughs> um, professional learning also in 2017-18 was we trained the principals, the assistant principals, the department chair, stat teachers. Um, we provided them with um, a climate overview and how restoration uh, impacts climate. Uh, we also implemented and, and uh, we outlined and delivered the message of a multi-tiered system of support. So looking at that, as referenced by Dr. Brinkley Parker earlier, looking at the continuum um, in a multi-tiered system of support, that continuum matches to be from just application throughout the whole school right up to a crisis situation where you would have to use an advanced formal conference. Um, and we also looked at functions be of behavior because we all know that whatever behavior manifests, um, as Ms. Shea said, is really to communicate to us a desire, a wish, or that something is uh, happening with a student. This is just a list of restorative practices in schools. On the left, you'll identify those that are currently in an initiative of about 17 schools, but we've had one school that's added them kind of added themselves. They have asked to um, bec become part of that initiative and we've welcomed them on. And then we have other schools that have independently sought out the support um, of developing um, a, a com community, so to speak, uh, within their schools of restorative practices. Um, where are we going? So um, we are a pretty ambitious group, and um, we have been talking via um, various grant funding um, options, and Maryland Aware being one of, one of two grants at this point that we've accessed. Um, our goal in those grants is always to build sustainability, uh, to be able to continually train um, and build capacity of trainers and staff. We also want to extend this to families. We have not um, been able to move solidly in that direction, but that is a goal in the future, to be able to have trainers who could also work within the schoolhouse. We have done some work where we've had parents come in and participate in overviews of restorative practices, but not actually participate in the training, and we would love to have that occur moving forward. Um, but where are we going? 2018-19, we are looking at six sessions of days one and two training. That may increase. Um, one session of day three and four training. Um, we anticipate that just in days one and two, we'll have 148 staff trained. Um, 25 staff trained in days three and four. We will have four additional sessions of days one and two training scheduled with 108 staff who are already registered for those sessions. 
Um, and we are um, setting the goal of 10 additional trainers um, to add to our current number of 12. Um, we are looking to partner with additional schools who have sought us out. Um, we continue to get requests um, to support schools in this initiative and planning on how they are going to implement restorative practices um, within their schoolhouse. Um, and one of the things that we are so grateful for is the MTSS resource teachers. They are also being trained and they will be trained as trainers so that they can work directly with their schools on building this restorative community throughout the schoolhouse and throughout um, the community as a whole. Um, we see the great benefit behind that. Additional professional learning, uh, five hours of implementation support. What does that look like? Um, that looks like partnerships with our vendors. Um, we've partnered, uh, we've had a wealth of partnership with Seadrum um, and had them come in, consult with us, do coaching with us, as well as give us some guidance on writing, writing guidance documents um, to move this work forward. Um, we are doing follow-up training with EDLP. We're doing a school team consultation where we're going out and looking at their plan and advising them on next steps. And we're doing training with them as well. Um, so we will continue to have the monthly leadership team meetings so that we can forge ahead with documents that support this work within the schoolhouse. Um, in 2018-2019, we're also going to customize leadership development and instruction. Uh, we have looked at um, feeder pattern cohorts, um, leadership professional development sessions that we can also provide the training um, for our leaders. Um, and we will focus and have focused this past summer um, on SPP and the climate goal. Uh, members of my team spent days and several days throughout the week um, working with school climate teams to really focus um, their goals and their initiatives and priorities if they had so choos chosen um, to utilize restorative practices in a whole school model. So allowing for us to give them guidance on that and then come back and uh, provide training and coaching around that as well. Um, and then we also are working within a restorative practices implementation survey to really look at what are the true needs that are coming out of training and implementation. And finally, this slide has the current vendors um, that are on the contract that we're looking to extend. And then one of them, I believe, is a free um, service that we use. Uh, when, if there is um, a situation where a formal conference needs to happen with a larger community set, we reach out, and that's the Conflict Resolution Center. Yes, they've been a partner of ours that we've been utilizing. They've collaborated with us as well to kind of assist us in, in moving this work forward. Um, and we've been able to go out, observe, and also mm -hmm. have them partner with us to resolve situations. Are there questions? <laughs> is there a particular form of restoration process that is already applied countywide, or is it particular to a school on what they decide? Yeah. So if schools are engaging um, in th what we're recommending, the IIRP, the International Institute for Restorative Practices program, yes, it's, it's very formal um, as far as the steps that you use when you're having a conference. Um, and that's the training, the days one, two, three, and four. Um, and as you see the numbers that were on, on the slides, those are the schools that um, have engaged with us and committed and have, um, we've used the grant funds to, to work with them. We realize there are other schools that are saying that they're doing restorative practices um, and they may not have participated in the IIRP four-day training um, or are a part of our grant initiative. So they, they would not be documented. Um, also, so is there, there isn't already a survey for feedback. The survey is a focus area for this school year. So um, we have collected information where schools are 
we've said to them, are you using restorative practices? And now we need to do a deeper level of that to say, tell us how many staff have participated in the four-day training. You know, so that that's the that deeper level of survey. The purpose of that for the leadership um, development planning is so that we can tier like the multi-tiered systems of support, we could tier the principals um, and the leaders and, and really focus on the professional learning that they need. Some are very advanced. They've participated in the training themselves and their schools have been doing it for multiple years. So obviously they need a diff different type of professional learning for the school year than someone who's never done it and their school isn't planning on engaging in it, but we want to give them an overview um, and, and information about it. So there'll be like a range of professional learning. Um, to add to that, I think to sort of the larger point, part of the program and the implementation of it is the fidelity in it. Mm -hmm. And so to be successful at making uh, an environment safe or having students and families feel included in building those relationships means that we are looking at each of the components and implement it, implementing them with fidelity. That means that we have to ensure that everybody is receiving training mm -hmm. and taking into account the needs of the environment. Good Thank questions. You. <laughs> You've answered part of my question, I guess, um, because I saw on the slides days one, day, days one and two and three and four. So it's a, it's a four day course mm -hmm. at, in, in its whole. Mm -hmm. um, are we losing anything, because I saw uh, that with a lot of them, there was a lot of day one and day two. Are we losing anything by not doing all four days? So the days three and four are uh, a more advanced training, like if you're going to be doing that formal conferencing, I don't know if you want to chime in, for, but the days one and two is more of the overview and the um, basic restorative questioning and circles that a lot of the teachers would be doing. The three and four is um, the more intense formal conference training. So if you look at the continuum, the slide where we provided the continuum, it's the third slide, I believe. If you take a look at that, um, days one and two training really look at effective statements, effective questions, small impromptu conversations, and then a small group circle environment. And so in those two days, what we're looking at is how we are setting the environment, but also how we're engaging the students and then how we're embracing and setting up that community within that classroom or the environment um, in the schoolhouse. When you get to days three and four, it's very intensive. It's called an advanced formal conference. It takes a lot of preparation and it takes a lot of um, planning and organizing the members so that there is high levels of support for all participants in the conference because the whole goal of that conference is to repair harm that's been done and to allow for accountability but also to allow anyone who's been offended to speak up and to share that information so that it's not just we talk to the person who committed the offense but we're having everyone talk about here's what happened here's what I felt, here's how you impacted me, and here's what we need to do to move forward so that this either doesn't happen again or we can agree on how, we're gonna have agreement on how we're gonna function in this environment. So it allows everyone to use language to really engage in a thoughtful problem solving process led by a facilitator who's impartial. Um, who doesn't have an investment in the situation at that moment. So there's a lot of work behind those two days. So I wanted to make sure that I'm painting the picture with you according to the continuum we've shared. Okay, and earlier you mentioned um, you've had parent participation in the training, but mainly for the overview. So that's them coming for like day one, the first couple hours, or that's something totally separate? Yes, so that's totally separate. Separate. That's where um, a, a school administrator or someone's leading this initiative in their school has said, I really want my parents to understand this concept, and they've asked um, us to come out, or they've consulted with one of our vendors and asked the vendor to come out and just do a brief overview.
our goal ultimately we're working with teachers, we're working with students, but our goal is to work with our parents so that that communication and that understanding of how we're problem solving and creating community is um, generalized not only in the instructional environment, but the school community and even larger into the communities outside of the schoolhouse for problem solving. Lofty goal, but yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. thank you. Also, in one of our high schools, we've taken a student group out to be trained. So that that was a new endeavor for one of our high schools at the end of last school year. How exactly is the effectiveness of the conference measured? On what scale? On whose perspectives are they measured by? So, are you for an advanced conference, the one I referenced? Um, how you measure that is really, are you able to come to an agreement? And generally you are. And then the follow-up, there's follow-up to that. So it doesn't just stop when you walk away and you have a written document that's an agreement, but there's follow-up to that. And so has everybody respected the agreements that were set? And if not, do we need to come back and, and do another conference and discuss and reset those agreements so that we can all be in this space together and respectfully? I'll just share very uh, quickly, um, and I know Dr. Wistedt's heard me speak mm -hmm. to this. Uh, so I'll just share in brief, as a principal, I had um, a conflict among some seventh grade young ladies. And the conflict began December 3rd. And um, all of our traditional methods of trying to address that altercation and conflict failed time and time again. Uh, and in fact, the conflict be among the young ladies escalated and, and um, more students became involved and um, it became truly a community issue. Um, and as an administrator, I had tried all, I mean, every traditional um, approach to dealing with uh, a student uh, discipline issue and every single one of those traditional practices failed um, and so I had the coincidental opportunity to uh, my school resource officer at the time had just gone to some professional development um, around restorative practices and I was speaking with him and I, I was really trying to get my head around what else how can I get under this conflict and really bring resolution and peace back to our students. And um, he said, well, I just had this training. We could try this. And I will tell you that our, it, it culminated in a formal conference for us because we were entirely untrained. And uh, that conference had 45 participants. Every student who was involved and a, a parent or adult guardian in their life participated in that formal facilitated conference. And I will tell you, I had never as an administrator and 20 some years of experience as an educator, I had never personally experienced a process that brought such level of authentic accountability, restoration, um, and resolution. And I will tell you that it was in experiencing it that, um, I really became um, profoundly aware of what a difference it can make. And so I'll just share that with you in that um, it is remarkable the amount of resolution that immediately those young ladies never again ever had another conflict. That entire process that, that took almost three months of school was almost instantaneously resolved at the end of that throughout that conference process. So I just share that as just one human uh, experience with this process. So thank you. Um, if, if there's no further questions, I think that really concludes our, our um, agenda for this evening. So thank you for exploring our resources with us and our summer programs.